Hi, everybody, and welcome to Exegetically Speaking, a podcast to the friends and faculty of Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois, and the Lanier Theological Library in Houston, Texas. My name is David Capes, and I am the Senior Research Fellow at the Lanier Theological Library and a former dean up there in Wheaton at the School of Biblical and Theological Studies. Our purpose in these podcasts is really very simple. We want to promote the study of biblical languages, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, so we can read the Bible more faithfully, study it more fully, and not just read it, but to live it. Today, joining me on Exegetically Speaking is Dr. Michael Graves, who is the Armour Dean Professor of Biblical Studies at Wheaton College and just a great colleague there. Michael, great to see you. Good to see you too, David. Hope you're doing well down in Houston. We are. It's a little bit warm down here, but uh, we expect we expect actually be coming your way in October for a few days, and I look forward to seeing you and catching up. Definitely. I look forward to being down. I'll be at a conference in February in Houston, and I look forward to visiting Lanier Theological Library. It's an amazing place. Oh, it is. It's a beautiful place, and some great things are happening right now. Sure. We're going to get right into it today because we're going to talk about adverbial participles. And uh, a lot of people say, well, what, what does that have to do with reading the Bible? Right, exactly. But a lot of what we see in the New Testament are adverbial participles, and there's some interpretive stuff that goes along with that. So first of all, what is a participle? Yeah, so um, a participle is a, uh, a verb that's being used as an adjective, sometimes as a noun. So in English, a lot of times we do it by making ing yeah. at the end of a word. So, you know, to laugh becomes laughing like a laughing child or a sleeping baby, you know, so they're verbs that are used as adjectives and uh, they can be used as nouns. And sometimes as we see in Greek, they can be used to kind of modify a whole sentence or the subject of the main verb or the rest of the clause. And that's what we'll be talking about today is these participles being used to kind of create clauses that modify other clauses. And as technical as that might sound, it has a real practical implication about translation, mm. and it's a great window into the process of translation and how translators make decisions and how some translations differ from others. And that's part of the payoff. It helps us as we understand translations. Why are they different? Uh, I've often had students ask me that question. Why, why are these translations different? As opposed to, you know, if they're trying to be literal, trying to be true to the word, et cetera, et cetera. Why are they different? And this is one of those places where you can say, let's camp out a little bit here. You were a student of Jerry Hawthorne. Yes, that's right. Uh, we were talking about that a little bit earlier, but uh, I took beginning Greek with uh, Gerald F. Hawthorne back at uh, Wheaton College in the early 90s. And uh, I remember him talking about this topic in my first year of Greek. And I remember it jumped out at me as like, wow, so this translation into English goes back to mm. that Greek. And it seemed to me that the translator had a certain amount of decision-making right. that they were doing based on how they wanted to handle this participle. And the Greek didn't make it 100% clear, like the translator had to make a decision. And Jerry was like, yep, that's right. That's how it goes. And he even had some real fun interpretations of some well-known participles that he took differently than other people did. But uh, that always stuck out at me in my first year of Greek as like a really notable thing that I learned in first year. So some people think this is really advanced stuff, but it is something that you have to cover in first year Greek. Not necessarily the first semester, but usually the second semester of first year Greek, as you would take it at, at Wheaton College. So let's look yes. at some text. Uh, we're going to start with Matthew chapter 2, verse 10, right? Okay, so I'll give you a few examples of these to give you know our listeners a chance to, to get a handle on what we're talking about. So Matthew chapter 2, this is the Magi. The Magi are coming to uh, see Jesus. They've followed the star to find him. And in Matthew chapter 2, verse 10, in the Greek, it says something like, now I'm being literalistic here, and having seen the star, they rejoiced exceedingly a great rejoicing. And so the having seen the star, that's our participle. And it's a pretty, you know, non-committal, non-interesting participle. I, I started with it because it's the most basic. You could render it like temporarily, like when they saw the star or once they had seen the star, they rejoiced. Mm -hmm. So greatly. there's something with time there related to time. Yeah. So normally when you take first year Greek, you get to learn all these exciting <laughs> labels for different things. And then you can talk about them with your Greek friends. Like, is that a temporal or a causal <laughs> participle? And it's temporal. 
So it's like when they saw the star, they rejoiced okay. greatly. Let's take take us to Matthew nineteen twenty two. Yeah, so Matthew nineteen twenty two. This is an example of the rich young ruler, and uh, you know after Jesus says a hard saying to him, says that the young man, having heard the word, went away being mm. grieved, for he had uh, many mm. possessions. Mm-hmm. And the participle I have in mind is being grieved. Now, it's not necessarily that he went away kind of just, you know, like at the time when he was being grieved or something. Normally that's called modal, or the answer is in what manner mm-hmm. was he? So it's a little bit of a mm-hmm. different nuance. So he went away, you know, being grieved. In a state of being grieved, mm-hmm. he went away. So that's modal. modal. So the first was temporal. The next mm-hmm. one is modal. So Matthew 6, 27, here's our next example. This one's from the Sermon on the Mount. This is the statement where Jesus says, Who among you, worrying, is able to add like one cubit to the span Mm -hmm. of his life? And so there, I again did it kind of literalistically. Who among you, worrying, can add to his life? Well, this one normally is thought of as instrumental. In other words, who by means of worrying is able to add Mm -hmm. on to his life. So it's kind of like the instrument by means of which you do something. Who, and most English translations will will handle it this way, who by worrying can add to his life. But it's just participle, and it's only the context. The participle doesn't give you this category of instrumental. You simply have to know what participles can do, and then which of those categories makes the best sense in the passage in front of you? Going back to the temporal, who from you, when you worry, are able to? I mean, you, it, it doesn't really fit the temporal class exactly. Yeah, who among you, when you're worrying, is able to do this? I think it means who among you, by means of worrying, exactly. can do this, is able to do this. Even the word dunamai, to mm-hmm. be able, gives you that sense that it's it's instrumental it's cause you know it's who can do Good. it by something and now matthew chapter 1 verse 19 matthew 1 19 is talking about the annunciation you know to joseph and it says joseph her husband as a mm-hmm. husband of mary being just and not wishing to expose her to shame wanted secretly to you know send her away mm-hmm. divorce her mm-hmm. but the, the the participle is being just joseph being a just person didn't want to expose mm. her to shame. Now, most translations will take this as causal, which I think makes good sense. Joseph, because he was just, didn't want to expose mm-hmm. her to shame. So I think most translations will handle it that way. Some of them may just leave it as being just if they're a bit more literalistic. But most translations I looked at handled this, if they did anything with it, as mm-hmm. causal because he was just. Although I suppose you could say that maybe if you would say that the, I don't think this is the case, and I would defer to my New Testament expert friend here, hmm. David Capes, to expound on this on another day. Of <laughs> another day, yes. Yeah, but you know, maybe somebody could say that if he were truly being righteous or just according to the law, he should have divorced her. Joseph, although he was just, but most people take yeah. it as causal. And so that's something these participles can do. They can be because, being just because he was just. So that's one side of it, is the causal. Now, if we flip over to so my last one, it's Philemon in verses 8 and 9. Paul is wanting to urge Philemon to do the right thing, to let Onesimus go so he can join Paul in ministry. But Paul wants him to do it because out of love, not because he's forced to. So in verse 8, Paul says, Therefore, having much boldness in Christ to command to you the thing Mm -hmm. you ought to do, for the sake of love, rather, I urge Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. The logic of that makes it clear that it's although. It's concessive. It's like, although I could command this for the sake of love, I'm just urging you to do it. You really have to know sort of the main verb, right? The other verb in the sentence or the clause in order to make sense of it. What are the relationship between the two? And you have to make those judgments, don't you? Yes, right. It's the relationship of the participle to the main verb. It's the relationship of the participle to the context as a whole. And what is sort of exciting to me but interesting about it, what struck me in my very first year of Greek when I learned it, 
was that the participle doesn't come with like a little color coding. <laughs> you know, like all the participles that are causal are blue and all the participles that are concessive are green. Like that would be super yeah. easy in Greek, but uh, it doesn't work that way. So it's a matter of knowing the Greek language, but also interpreting the words in front of you in the context in which they are found. And uh, I guess one payoff I'd like for uh, all of our you know, friends here today listening to think about is that when you're reading an English translation, very frequently you're reading the translator's interpretation mm -hmm. of how this participle relates to the rest yeah, of the sentence. Exactly. And uh, the translations that people have out there that folks use, you know, that come to Wheaton College are very good. You, no one should think their Bible is filled with, you know, mistakes or lies or anything. But if you do check different translations, you will find sometimes that different translations choose to handle passages differently. And that is a little window, an entryway into the world of careful, precise interpretation of the Greek text and why it's important to, you know, use different translations or check commentaries if you're yes, an English definitely. reader. If you're going to become a serious teacher of the Bible, I think it's really important to learn Greek. I think you're exactly right, and that's one of the reasons we're doing exegetically speaking. I remember when Michael Gorman, a few years ago, just looked at Philippians 2.6. I had always taken that huparkon as a concessive participle. Although Jesus, being in the form of God, he did not consider becoming equal with God as something to be held on to or grasped. But he made the case that that's not, in fact, a concessive participle. It's causal. Because Jesus was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be held on to. And so there is an interpretive thing there. And we're going to get Michael Gorman on to talk about that one day. Yeah, that's, that's a great example. And, uh, you know, so as you're looking at it in Greek, you're confronted with something that is something like, being in the form of God, you know, he did not consider being equal with God a thing to be seized. And then it's up to the, the reader to decide what is the relationship between being in the form of God and not yes. grasping. Yes. And yeah. I think most translations take it mm. as although, but I've heard some people that take it as because. I know actually Jerry Hawthorne, my old Greek teacher, talked about it that way in class as well. And it'll be fun for you to have uh, Professor Gorman on to talk about, you know, how he sees that passage. And I think it'll be probably illuminating for the passage and also just in great encouragement for people yep, to study and, Greek. Indeed. And to know his work. Michael is a great friend and he's also a very competent scholar. Done some great work in Paul and in the Gospels as well. Very great insights today. Thanks so much, Michael, for being with us here on Exegetically Speaking. Great to be with you and blessings to everybody. Thanks to Ian Rosine, Rebecca Larson, and Silvio Vasquez, who helped us produce this podcast. Thanks as well to John Alonzma, our Wheaton-based director, who makes this podcast possible. We're grateful to Phil Keggy for our music. If you want to study biblical languages, then you need to consider Wheaton College. Whether you're an undergraduate or a graduate student, we have amazing programs, a first-rate faculty, and some of the best students in the world. So go to the website, www.wheaton.edu, and look for Modern and Classical Languages. Get started today. If you have questions about this or any of our podcasts, we'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions or questions about any passage in the Hebrew Bible or Greek New Testament, send us an email and we'll see if we can get one of our experts to weigh in on that for you. Our email is exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. That's exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. Thanks for listening. <laughs>